happens in this series, we're going to be looking at synthesizers and keyboards and how new technology has changed the face and the sound of modern music. The noise I make comes from these instruments. For example, this synth gives me this great sound we heard in our opening piece. Or I can link up several synths via this sequencer to produce a sophisticated backing track at the touch of a button. Or I can faithfully reproduce chunks of sound called samples and play them just like you would any other machine using this machine, a sampler. The keyboard was originally favoured by synth designers like Bob Moog and Alan Perlman because it was the easiest way of telling the synth which notes were being played. The keys act as switches, turning on or off the signals which produce the notes. From a playing point of view, synthesizers gave access to a whole new range of sounds and effects, but a major limitation of these early keyboards was their lack of touch sensitivity. Basically, a, a, a piano key is on the path to the, um, the actual thing that produces the sound, which is the string. Um, the way you hit the key, the, the volume or, uh, and the speed with which you, you hit the key determines how the sound is going to be. These things are completely different. These keys are only switches. Uh, volume happens to be a parameter that's controlled by the speed only that this key goes down. So uh, uh, the whole system is different. And at this point, uh, synthesizers are still not quite as sensitive. You can't get all the nuances out of the synthesizers with your fingers that you can out of an acoustic piano. But that day will come. Besides a lack of touch sensitivity, early synths had two other main drawbacks. You couldn't memorize sound settings so that you had to reprogram manually every time you wanted a new sound. And secondly, if you wanted to play polyphonically more than one note at a time, you had to use synths in a modular form which meant that you usually ended up with a backache and a huge overdraft. They looked and sounded something like this. Notice especially the potted plant. This sort of setup just wasn't practical for most players, and manufacturers in the early days did their best to produce synthesizers which were both polyphonic and programmable. An early polyphonic machine was the Merlotron, which used tape samples of strings and choirs, and was popular with bands like Genesis and Yes. Delightful, but the Mellotron was incredibly unreliable when it came to performing live. Genesis keyboard player Tony Banks. The Mellotron was, was a notorious instrument. It was, a, it was put together, the early one I had, which was also a great big thing. I mean, they really did make it out of whatever they lay could lay their hands on it. You use bicycle chains and vacuum cleaner motors, you know. And they had these ridiculous large kind of um, drums with tape on them. And you, you, I mean, incredible technique of searching the tapes to find the right, the right tone and everything which they had. And the whole system just went wrong all the time. And we had to use it. We got to the stage where we were re rebuilding it every night because it was structurally so unsound and it was, it was real chaos. Now, you might all have heard the terms analog and digital bandied around a lot of music. And certainly, when it comes to synthesis, it's important to understand the difference between them. All early synths were analog, that's voltage controlled. Many modern synths from the Prophet 5 onwards are analog too, but with an element of digital technology in them in the form of a microcomputer used to memorize sound settings and recall them instantly. Now, analog synths create sound by generating an electric current using oscillators and then filtering out certain frequencies and shaping it with the envelopes. Fully digital synths, however, use computer technology to create much more complex waveforms and therefore much more accurate imitations of other instruments. These waveforms are generated mathematically in binary code and aren't subject to the degeneration that voltages suffer by being pushed through a circuit board. This makes for a much cleaner and clearer sound than analog synths are able to produce. At its simplest, a synthesizer converts voltage into sound waves. Now, sound has three main elements, pitch, timbre or tone color, and loudness or amplitude. Pitch and timbre are determined by oscillators, which are the basic source of sound in a synth, and these are defined respectively by their range and their wave shape. 
The purest waveform you can get is a sine wave, which you can hear in this sound. The sawtooth waveform is usually used for brass type sounds. And the square waveform gives a thinner sound, which is useful for string sounds. Because synthesizer control is now in digital form, it means the synths can talk to each other, or even other digital devices such as sequencers, drum machines, or even computers. This is all down to a magical device known as MIDI. Almost every electronic keyboard available today comes equipped with MIDI, and this means you really don't need programming skills in order to get your own unique sound. You can combine sounds from different synths in any way you like. For instance, I can start with this piano sound. of MIDI, sequences have got a lot more sophisticated, and this is one of the latest machines available. Because MIDI transmits simultaneously on up to 16 different channels, this machine is effectively a 16-track digital recorder. It will faithfully record all the nuances of your performance, like this. And, unlike a standard tape recorder, you can speed it up without changing the pitch. Right, I'll start off with a real s simple sequence. So, what I'd do is I'd go to a, this, the real-time page on this particular computer to write the first pattern. Um, OK. Select my MIDI channel on this keyboard, which is my master keyboard. Um, and then I'll get a click from that, hopefully and just write something down. And then on this computer, I press a uh, figure there, and that time corrects it to 16s. That's whatever figure you punch in. Now you can edit or, or change about, or take notes out that you don't like. Um, and then you just go on to the next sound, OK? So I change the MIDI channel on my master keyboard. Write the drum pattern. So... And just play the... On, on the keyboard, I've got all the, name, the, the numbers of the drums, you see? Because the drum machines are there, and each drum um, is represented by a note on the keyboard, OK? So... Um, now I can overdub on that, make it more interesting. Um, perhaps put some hi-hat in or something like that. In fact, you can sort of continue overdubbing at different sounds. OK, once I've got those patterns, then I'll start arranging it into a song. So I'll go into a different page. And just build the song this way. Each number rep represents like sort of a two by section. And um, just carry on continuing the numbers. And that's it. At the same time that the analogue sequences appeared on the market, so did the dreaded drum machine. 
similar to a sequencer, except that it's got its own sound stored on board. A mid-priced machine like this has reached a remarkable level of sophistication. It's got its digital samples. Um, these are constantly updatable. You can change them by sticking ROM cards or RAM cards in the bottom here. So that means that you can even have non-drum sound. Rats, rats, They're all tunable like this. Um, they're touch sensitive. You can even alter the decay. <coughs> Not only that, but as you've seen, I can access them via MIDI and play them off these pads. Using MIDI synth sequences and drum machines can give you access to new sounds and can be a lot of fun. But of course, all this technology can also be very complicated. So we went out and asked two top keyboard players how they managed to cope with the barrage of technology facing the musician nowadays. A player like me doesn't really have to spend that much time trying to come up with sounds. Because there are banks and banks and banks of sounds coming down the MIDI pipeline. And all you have to do is audition all of them, <laughs> it'll take a while. And uh, then you pick some and you can always edit and make them fit what you want to do. But I've spent, uh, since uh, the uh, advent of MIDI, I've spent less and less time really trying to come up with brand new sounds. Because there are only few sounds that you really like and that you have to make for yourself. And uh, I still do those, homemade. But on the other hand, there are so many sounds that are available uh, especially for, let's say, for Yaka, like the uh, instrument like the Yamaha or the expander over time, that uh, there's no reason for anyone to even spend any time and try and tweak the sound from scratch yourself. You know, you just go through the things that are available, and you find something that's close, and then you have to know what to tweak to make it perfect for you. With early synthesizer work, you always program your own sounds. Um, now, because there's so many instruments, and so many different technologies that many musicians are employing the use of other people to do the programming so that they can spend their time and spend their mind conceiving. It's hard to do both because it takes a long time to program. By the time you program this thing, you forget what you were gonna program it for or forget the idea that you're gonna have afterwards. So, so usually when I'm working on a record, although I do know basically how to program a DX7. When I'm working on, on a record, I usually have somebody here programming it for me. So that's their secret. They either use presets and just alter them a little bit to get the sounds they want, or they're lucky enough to have somebody else to do the programming for them.